Our subject for this afternoon, micro-integrity. What did I say? Micro, now you won't find it in the dictionary. Um, I made it up. But I made it up with Ellen White's help. She uses minutia. Somewhere she said, the principles of God should enter into the minutia of our lives. When I read that, something struck me. She's saying, all that we do should be driven by the principles of integrity and righteousness and right doing. And so I thought of the minutia, that's micro, I thought of integrity. So I came up with micro integrity, and I'm waiting right now actually for the trademark. I applied for one. <laughs> no, I did. I applied for one. I said, Father, let me get this thing so I can develop some presentations. So I'm going to present the fundamental principles, there's several of them, I'll give you three, of micro integrity. But I want to give you the Bible passage on which micro integrity is based. Before I begin, please remember use the Bible where you can. Ask God to put his words in my mouth. Jeremiah 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And favor number three, let's think. Come now, Isaiah 1 18, let us reason together. Let's pray again. Loving Father in heaven, thank you, dear God, for freedom of worship in this country. It will not last forever, Father. Help us to do all we can while we have this privilege. Bless every man, woman, boy, and girl. Speak through me, Father, very clearly. Let me be conscious of seeking your glory and keeping myself subjugated. Bless those listening via the internet, dear God. We thank you for their presence by faith. Now, take all the glory, Father, but bless your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 14. Genesis 14. We read from verse 1, our subject, micro-integrity. Now the Bible says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, Bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Listen again. Listen microscopically. Godliness is profitable unto all things. It is always profitable to do us right. Having promise of the life that now is and the life that is to come. Doing what's right has benefits now and in the world to come. Not so with dishonesty. Genesis 14, reading from verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Eleser, Kedoleoma, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeba, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. Now, these four kings came to fight five kings. Are you with me? The king of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, Bela. Five kings, and that's the area where Abraham lived. The, 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 the four kings came from the other side of the Euphrates River, and they came. Now, in this battle, we won't read the whole chapter, Lot is taken captive. Let's go to verse 11 of Genesis 14. Read with me, what does it say? And they did what? Took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and... And did what? And went their way. And they took Lot, verse 12, Abraham, brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. Hmm. Verse 13. And there came one that had escaped until Abraham the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the brother of Eshcol and of Anna, and these were confederates with Abraham. Now Lot has been captured. And Abraham finds out. Verse 14, and when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, this is interesting, let's digress. Not his nephew, his brother. In Christ, we are brother and sister spiritually. When Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his strange servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto, unto 
Dan, yes. And he divided himself and his servants against them by night and smote them and pursued them unto what? Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. Now, 16. And he brought back all the goods and also brought his, his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. Verse 17. And the uh, king of Sodom went out to meet Abraham after his return from the slaughter of Kedaloma in the vale of, which is the, uh, the, the king's dale. Now, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, let's go to verse 21. Now, the king of Sodom said to Abram, what? In verse 21, what does he say? Give me the persons, take the goods. Why? Because when uh, the country was captured, the, the, the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian kings took all the people with them. Back then, you, you took people with you, you captured them, you relocated them. So they ceased to be a problem. They did that to the northern kingdom. That's called the lost tribes of Israel. They relocated them. They did that to the southern kingdom. That's why Babylon, uh, Daniel and those boys went to Babylon. Now, so the king of Sodom now, he had run. <laughs> when the battle, he ran and hid, according to verse 10. That's where he hid. Now that Abraham has won, he comes out of his hole, and he says, give me the persons, give me back my people so I can populate my cities, but you take all the possessions. Now, micro-integrity, verse 22. Read with me if you have my version. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Carefully now, that I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abraham rich. Stop. Well, let's finish the, the final verse. Save what? That which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the young men which went with me, Anna, Eschol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. Abraham says, I am taking what? Nothing. And he, he says, not a thread, nor shoelace. Ladies, when you wear your skirts, you see a thread. You cut it off. Am I right? The little thing hanging off, that can't work. One hair out of place, you put it in place. Abraham said, I am not taking a thread. That's micro. Not a shoelace. Now, Abraham culturally had the right. Are you with me? Back then, you won the war. You kept everything. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and the U.S. led this invasion, the, 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 the Iraqi forces started leaving with TVs and all sorts of stuff they took from the Kuwaitis. They took the, 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 you know, the spoils of war. That's what happened then. Abraham being a different kind of soldier, knowing that he has to honor God. He said, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord. What, 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 what does he mean? He swore. Don't wait until you come to the situation. Make up your mind before. Abraham had already decided, I'm taking nothing. You go on a date, decide I'm not doing that. Before you go. I know, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> Are you listening? Don't wait until, you know, you've had two drinks and you're not thinking straight. Decide before you leave the house. Know this, know that, know that behind a tree. Are you with me? Now, Abraham decided, I am not taking anything. So when the king of Sodom came and said, look, take all that stuff. He gives a reason. Look at verse 23. Lest thou should say, I have made Abraham rich. I can't bring that on my God. Micro integrity. I'm not taking a button. I'm not taking a thread. In other words, in every little thing I do, I have to consider God. That's how we should run our businesses. Not profit first, honor, integrity. Oh, you didn't hear me. Not profit first, honor. But integrity is a profitable business strategy because the king of heaven will bless you. 
Are you following me? The king of heaven will reward you when you think of him and you honor his name by the way you practice your business. We live in a world where profit is the driving motive. But when profit is your reason for existence, when there's a conflict between profit and principle, you'll, you'll, you'll stand behind profit, not principle. Let me say it again. It was clumsy. Your reason for existence is what you'll defend in crisis. So corporations are set up to make money. That's why they are legally set up. To make money by any means necessary. In times of crisis, some corporations prefer to see loss of life than loss of profit. You act as though you've never heard that. There are companies that prefer to see loss of life than loss of profit. Several years ago, someone discovered in a garbage can some notes that were left from a meeting from one of the car companies. And they were discussing which is more profitable, paying damages or repairing or fixing the cars. And they decided it's more profitable to pay damages to those who've lost loved ones than to fix the cars. Listen to me. We live in a world where profit trumps life. And I hear, there's no, there's no pun. Profit <laughs> takes the place of life. Are you following me? That's the word. <laughs> I didn't mean that. <laughs> don't call him, don't call him, don't tell him. Uh, but the word to trump is to, 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 to get over somebody. All right. So that's, <laughs> that's the world in which we live. But we must be different. Now, Abraham gave up everything. He suffered a loss in the eyes of the king of Sodom. Go to chapter 15. Chapter 15. We read from verse 1. Are you there? That's chapter 15 of Genesis. Read with me. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Abraham, what you lost, I will take its place. Come on, say amen for God. You lost clothes, you lost silver, you have me. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Immediately after Abraham gives up all of that for the sake of integrity and the honor of God, God says, Abraham, I approve. I am your reward because everything I have is yours. That's where micro-integrity comes from, for me. Abraham said, I will not take from a thread to a shoe latchet. If you run a business... When your accountant comes in to do your whatever, your books, every dime of profit should come with a clear conscience. Let me be more extreme. Every penny should shine with the clarity of a clear conscience. We cannot be driven by the dimes and the nickels in our eyes, the money, we must be driven by what's the reflection on my God. That's micro-integrity. Now, that's where it comes from. Let's look at some basic principles of micro-integrity. Principle one, everything belongs to God. Come on, I need a louder amen than that. Unless you can prove you created something. The, the basis of ownership is creation. Most of the amens come from this side. <laughs> Did you get lunch? <laughs> That's not. The book Education, page 137, paragraph 4. I almost said let's go there, but no, you don't have it. Education 137, paragraph 4. Listen to this powerful statement. And Exxon and, and uh, all these big companies, Microsoft and Apple need to learn this. Are you ready? What book did I say? What page? 137, what paragraph? 
Here's what it says. That which lies at the foundation of business integrity and true success is the recognition of God's ownership. When setting up a business, your first acknowledgement must be everything belongs to God. This inventory that I think is mine belongs to God. That which lies at the foundation of business integrity and true success is the recognition of God's ownership. The creator of all things. He is the original proprietor. All that we are his stewards. All that we have is a trust from him to be used according to his direction. Everything belongs to God, says Ella White. But the Bible said it before she said it. Psalm 24. Now what I'm telling you is literal. We're not reading from Revelation. This, what I'm about to read, is literal. And we'll read it more than one place. The Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Witness number one, Psalm 24, verse 1. When you found it, say amen. amen. All right, some of you still looking. We have time. It's 25 to 4. Yeah, we, <laughs> okay, the whole hour. All right, we have an hour, but we need, still need to move. Are you there now? Read with me. The earth is the Lord. Stop. Put that in modern English. Put that in Silver Springs English. What does it mean? God owns the whole world. Let's add some details. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Stop. What's the fullness? Itemize. The trees. You need trees to make wood. That's why they're cutting down the rainforest. Uh-huh. The, the every atom, every molecule. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, that's micro, yes. <laughs> what else? The water belongs to God. Come on, let's go beneath the earth. The gold belongs to God, you South Africans. The diamonds belong to God, you DRCers. Huh? The copper belongs to God, you Zambians. Everything belongs to God. The wild animals belong to God, you Kenyans, huh? Belong to God. Now listen to the Bible again. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Everything belongs, say it with me, to God. Is this from Revelation? Is it symbolic? It is literal. You know what God said to Job? Gird up now thy loins, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? <laughs> you walking around as though you own the world. Where were you when I made it? And that question is for us. Where were you when I put gold in the earth? You know, Genesis 2 from verse 10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which goes towards the um, land of Havilah, where there's gold. And the gold of that land is good. There's delium and the onyx stone. God put precious stones in the earth. Where were you? You work for a jewelry store? You are a jeweler? It's, it's not yours? It's God's. To prove it absolutely belongs to you, you must be able to show you made it. When God made the earth, the last thing he made were people. They opened their eyes and found everything already there. That wasn't by accident. Adam could not claim to be an assistant creator. He did not make one blade of grass. But too many of us walk around as though we are assistant gods. You're not. Everything belongs to God. Go to Psalm 50. We're looking at the first principle. Everything is God's. God is the original owner, and he still is. But he likes to have people to help him. Psalm 50, we'll read from verse 10. We're reading literal words, not symbolic. You found it? Read with me. For every beast of the forest is mine. And the cattle upon a thousand hills, 
I know all the fowls of the mountain and the wild beasts of the field are mine. Now listen to verse 12. It's very uh, embarrassing. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. Why? Because everything is mine. The world is mine and the fullness has gone. Look, if I were hungry, I wouldn't go to McDonald's. Everything is mine. Mine. Right now where you and I sit, everything belongs to God. That's the first rule of starting a business. That's the first rule of starting a family. Those children belong to God. I heard one amen. If parents would literally realize that child belongs to God, they would raise their children differently. Because we are more careful with what belongs to others than what belongs to us. So when I drive my car, I drive anyway. When I drive somebody else's car, I'm careful. That child belongs to God. And he has asked you, raise that child for me. The same way the Egyptian princess, we believe, had Shepsut, told the mother of Moses, raise this boy for me. Are you with me? All right. What's the first principle of micro-integrity? Everything belongs to God. We've looked at two witnesses to that, Psalm 24, verse 1, Psalm 50, 10 to 12. Let's look at another witness to that fact. First Chronicles 29, we'll read from verse 11. First Chronicles 29, reading from verse 11. What I want to do, if the Lord allows me, is to make these presentations to business people as a way of presenting the gospel. So the gospel is, you're converted to do what's right. Are you following me? Did you hear what I said? The gospel changes people from doing what's wrong to doing what's right and doing it naturally. And so I want to present these things to business people and every principle I try to bring in some Bible teaching without mentioning it and see if we can appeal to uh, the higher-ups who won't come to church. They'll come to a hotel and at a seminar. Are you following me? But we have to find ways to reach people. If you want to discuss how to make money, they'll come. So I will have it micro-integrity, and the, the little saying under it will be pursuing principal profit. Are you following me? What kind of profit? Principal profit. The, the Bible doesn't say don't pursue profit, but it must be principal. So micro-integrity, pursuing principal profit. All right. What book did I say? First Chronicles. What chapter? 29. Reading what verse? 11. Read with me. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Stop. Let's look at some other things that belong to God, non-physical. Greatness. Mm -hmm. Name some great people. Abraham Lincoln was a great man. Okay, greatness is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. Because God can stop you from being great. Are you listening to me? He can stop you from being great. Nebuchadnezzar has something. Yeah, the Lord had to, you know, he misunderstood his greatness. God turned him into an animal for seven years. The Bible says when he lifted up his eyes and acknowledged God, his, God gave him back his mind. God is a, hmm. God loves, but ooh, don't let God put his hand on you. You know what the Bible says? It's a fearful thing to fall into the hand. Don't let God put his hand on you in judgment. That's why the Bible says humble yourself. Because if God has to humble you, you will limp for the rest of your life. And he's a loving God. So greatness belongs to God. Who else is great? Martin Luther King. God gave him that greatness for the benefit of mankind. You name a great person, greatness is a gift from God because God can withhold it from you. Greatness, what's the next one? Power. Everyone in power is allowed in power by God. Daniel 2.21, he setteth up kings and removeth them. It's a gift from God for the service of others and the glory of God. Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, if you are in a position of power, God has allowed it or directly given it to you. Here's what Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. 
For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thy hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. God gave Nebuchadnezzar his kingdom. By the way, he told Jeremiah, tell the Hebrews, submit to Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. And try to live a peaceful life until I decide to get you. Listen to me. God told the Israelites, submit to, to, to Nebuchadnezzar. Think of that when you try to oppose the government. Submit. That was the message. And I'll get you out when I'm ready. And he told him, live a quiet, peaceful life so that your, your conquerors don't make life difficult for you. Then is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. All these non-physical things are gifts from God which he gives ultimately for his glory and the blessing of his fellow man. All right, so let's go on. And thou art exalted as head above all. Next verse, both riches and honor come of thee. Mm -hmm. You're rich? Thank God. By the way, God has a plan to take care of the poor. He gives money to the rich. And he tells them, I help the poor. And the rich say, no. Then we blame God. Are you following me? I know you're not listening. You're not digesting your food. Listen, God has a plan to take care of the poor. But God loves to work with people. He says, how can I take care of the poor? Ah, let's use people to take care of people. He says, look, here's $100. You see that guy? He's hungry. Then God steps back and watches you. And what do you do? Well, let's switch it. What do I do? I keep all the money. Then someone says, what a hard God. Riches come from God to be a blessing to others. Both riches and honor, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might. And in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, verse 13, we praise thee, we, 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 we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Read verse 14 with me nice and loud and clear. What does it say? But who am I? Who do I think I am? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? God is saying, David is saying, who do we think we are that we can give God something? Who do I think I am to give? How do you give me what's mine? So who am I and what are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? Finish the verse with me now. For all things come of thee. Come on. And of thine own have we given thee. Look at verse 16. O oh Lord our God, all this store which we have what? Prepared to build a house to thine holy name, cometh of thy hand, and all is thine. The wood, the precious stones, everything David gathered that Solomon might build a temple. Solomon said, it's yours. You're listening to me, I believe. You're watching me, you're looking. <laughs> Gentlemen, that suit you're wearing belongs to God. Even if it's on layaway and you haven't finished paying yet. It belongs to God. Are you with me? Ladies, that designer handbag you have, Gucci, whoever, it belongs to God. The only thing that rightfully belongs to us is our sins. <laughs> right, but God wants them too. Are you following me? He said, come, <laughs> give them to me. Your bank account, God. Your Toyota Rava or Toyota whatever, Honda, whatever it is, God. Your Ford Focus, God. Your Toyota Camry, God. Your bicycle, <laughs> God. Are you with me? Let us develop the mindset, God, God's. 
God's. But he has honored me by making me a steward. Mm -hmm. He said, now you take care of that. In such a way that two things happen. I am glorified and other people blessed. What are we talking about today? Micro integrity. You're taking an exam, you don't cheat. Even if the, the professor forgot the answer sheet right on your desk and left it open at the page where you had difficulty. <laughs> Are you with me? You, you, you turn away and you take the exam facing north, the paper facing. Why? Because you practice micro integrity. If I pass this exam, I must pass it not with 99, with the clear conscience. Let's look at the second principle of micro-integrity. Go to Matthew 20. Now, while you're looking for Matthew 20, let me tell you one reason why I'm stressing this. Most of our time is not spent in church. Are you with me? Most of our time is spent in secular settings. So if the only time you and I are honest is in church, we're only honest two hours in a week, and there are 168 hours. Are you with me? So it just won't work. Most of the Christian's Christianity is seen outside the church. When he doesn't have his hymnal or his Bible or there's no choir, are you following me? When all the trappings that encourage him to behave a certain way are removed. I was in Germany a few years ago, and I was taking an old church built in the, in the 1500s. And uh, we walked into the church, and people started whispering. There's no service. But something about the church, you say, I'm in the church. And they're whispering. It's the church where the, the wedding scene for uh, uh, the Sound of Music was held, very famous, and there's a special tour. And people, whoosh, 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 because, because of the surroundings, it affected their behavior. So you come to church, and there's an organ playing, and there's a piano, and there's, you know, people reading the Bible. So you behave like, you know, the angel Gabriel. <laughs> now, that's only two hours in a week. Right? Now, you leave that, you go to the office where people are drinking coffee and smoking and cussing, and they're stressed out. And, ooh, that you have to still behave like the angel Gabriel. <laughs> Genuinely. <laughs> are you with me? Now, so most of our time is spent away from a spiritual environment. I mean an overt spiritual environment because wherever God is, that's spiritual. Okay, now, Matthew 20. Let's read verse 28 of Matthew 20. It's a well-known verse. Read it for me if you have my version. Start again, start again, and even if the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Now, the second principle of micro-integrity is we live to serve. The purpose of life is service, not accumulation. Let's look at that in a very deep way. First, I'll give you a quotation from Ellen White. Historical Sketches, page 285, paragraph 4. What did I say? Historical Sketches, page 285, paragraph 4. Ellen White says, Every youth should be impressed with the fact that he's not his own, he or she. His strength, his time, his talents belong to God. She goes on to say, it should be his chief purpose in life to glorify God and to do good to his fellow man. That's it. That's it. The same paragraph, further down she writes, every youth, every child has a work to do for the glory of God and the salvation of souls that are ready to perish. Only two things. Let me put it very bluntly. You and I are on this earth for two reasons. The glory of God and the betterment of our fellow man. That's it. 
Let's look at the Ten Commandments. What's Commandment 1? That expresses your duty to whom? God. This way. Commandment 2. All right. No, don't make them. Don't worship them. That expresses your duty to whom? God. That's vertical. Commandment 3. Stop. That's my duty to whom? God. That's vertical. Commandment 4. Keep it holy. My duty to God. Vertical. Commandment 5. That's my duty to whom? Mankind. Mother, whomever. Not or just biological parents. All the members of the church come under that commandment. No, you didn't hear me. Let the Bible tell you. Against an elder... Receive not, uh, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. And the older women as mothers. The younger men as brothers, and the younger women as sisters. That's 1 Timothy 5, verses 1 and 2. The older men are fathers. The older women are mothers. The younger girls are sisters. And if more young boys saw girls as sisters, their behavior would change. I don't do that to my sister. So commandment five covers all the members of the church who are not biologically connected. Because the strongest bond is not biological, it is spiritual. Because in time of trouble, your family will tell the authorities where you're hiding. All right. Where was I? What? Yes, commandment, commandment seven. Where well, commandment six, thou shalt not kill, that's horizontal. Commandment 7, thou shalt not commit adultery, that's duty to man. Commandment 8, thou shalt not steal, duty to your fellow man. Thou shalt not bear false witness, your duty to your fellow man. Thou shalt not covet our duty to our fellow man. Now we have the Ten Commandments express two directions of duty. And both directions go that way. They don't go this way. God, fellow man, that's it. Now what I'm saying is extreme. Let me put it more bluntly. You were not put on this earth for you. That's the way things function in hell. That's the way things function under Satan's system. You put on this earth for you. In God's system, you put on this earth for him and for her. But first of all, for him. Listen to this quotation, beautiful quotation, Ellen White. The Desire of Ages, page 20, paragraph 2. There is nothing save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. There is no leaf of the forest or lowly blade of grass, but has its ministry. Every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth that element of life without which neither man nor animal could live. And man and animal in turn minister to the life of tree and shrub and leaf. The flowers breathe fragrance and unfold their beauty and blessing to the world. The sun sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds. The ocean, itself the source of all our springs and fountains, receives the streams from every land but takes to give. The mists ascending from its bosom fall in showers to water the earth that it may bring forth and bud. What is she saying? Everything created was created to serve something else. Now this is heavenly mindset. Conversion allows us to begin to understand that. How are we born? Me, myself, and I. That's how we're born. Get while you can get. As some leaders do when they get into power. Get while you can get before you're voted out. The Christian understands, I am on the earth for the glory of God and the service of others. Now, you may say, you know, a friend of mine asked me once, he said, Randy, when do I express myself? I said, never. Never. 
because the original standard was, let us make man in our image. Now, that was to function how many hours in the day? 24. How many days in the week? Seven. How many hours in the week? 168. Let us make man in our image so that everything man did should have reflected God. Adam did not have an image of himself, of himself, until he sinned. Are you with me? Before he sinned, his image was God's image. And if he and Eve had had a child while they were sinless, that child would have been born with whose image? God's image. That's all Adam had. When he sinned, he developed another image. By the way, it's the devil's image. Ladies and gentlemen, sons and daughters of God, to serve God is to live a radically different life. I mean different. You and I are on this earth for the sake of others. Now, you may ask, well, shouldn't I go to school? Yes. Go to school and do your PhD so that you may be highly qualified to serve others. Should I take care of my body and be healthy? Yes. So you can be qualified to serve others. Whatever you do, the motive is the glory of God, service to others. And so you ask, by the way, those are the only two questions to ask when you're about to make a decision. You see some young man you like, you want to have a relationship, okay? Where's the glory for God in this? Not now I can tell my other girlfriends I've got a man just like you. No. Where is the glory for God in this? And that's no joke. And what's the blessing to my fellow man if I get tied up in this thing? You want a child? Two questions. How will God be glorified if I get a child? Or the seventh child. How will God be glorified or others blessed? There is no escape from these two questions. I want to move from Silver Springs to Miami. How will God be glorified? And you literally sit down and try to figure out, here is how you'll be glorified, Father. Mm -hmm. You've all heard 1 Corinthians 10.31. Say it for me. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, finish it. That's not a joke. Now, someone will be saying, well, this guy is extreme. No, I'm not extreme. I'm just biblical. That's all. Listen to Jesus. I want you to read it with me. Go to John 8. Listen to Jesus. Then you can accuse him of being extreme, and you'd be right. Because if heaven is light and hell is darkness, a child of light is extreme in the eyes of a child of darkness. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right is extreme in the eyes of wrong. Do you have John 8? Let's read verse 29. Listen to this testimony from the lips of Christ. When you found it, read if you, with me if you have my version. And he that hath sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. Finish the verse. For I do most of the time those things that please him. All the time. Now. Always. Which means that Jesus never acted on a self-centered motive. I never said he didn't have them. He was human. Having a self-centered motive is not a sin. Acting on it is. Jesus never acted on a self-centered motive. Because all expressions of self are offensive to God. And so your Savior says, I do always. In order to do always the things that please God, every action you contemplate, you must think first of God. And since God said, you can't love your brother, you can't love me and hate your brother. How can you love God who you've not seen and not love your brother whom you've seen? So loving God is expressed in loving the fellow man. Are you following me? And so when Jesus says, I do always the things that please God, he's virtually saying, I think of him first and my brother and sister. 
always. Micro-integrity. What's the first principle of micro-integrity? Everything belongs to God. What do you do in 1 Timothy? For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Listen again. You and I brought nothing. Not even our own limbs. They belong to God. Because we didn't make them. And as we came, that's how we go. I don't care how much gold you throw into that grave. Are you with me like the Egyptians did and other foreign cultures? I don't care how many things you put in that grave for the afterlife. You're going as you came naked. Principle two of microintegrity. Service is the reason for life. That's why we're given life to serve. Here's a third principle. It's called honest loss before dishonest gain. Are you lost? It is better to lose honestly than to make a profit. How? Dishonestly. Let's go back to Abraham. Let's go to Abraham. Back to Genesis 14. You read from verse 21 of Genesis 14. Our heading, micro-integrity. Do you have Genesis 14, verse 21? Read with me. King of Sodom said unto Abram, what? Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. What an invitation. Take all the money. Most of us, you don't have to tell us that twice. You don't have to finish your sentence. Verse 22. Read with me. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, come on. I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God. The possessor of heaven and earth, stop. Who possesses heaven and earth? Uh -huh. Not the king of Sodom. God. Melchizedek said that back in verse uh, 19 or 20. He said the same thing. That I will not take from a thread, even to shulach it. And I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abraham rich. Now, Abraham is suffering an honest loss. Instead of pursuing dishonest gain. It is better to go bankrupt because you're honest than to enter Fortune 500 because you're dishonest. I need more amens. Don't get me nervous. It is better to go broke because you're honest than to be on the same level as Bill Gates because you're dishonest. Do not be dazzled by money. Money is a servant. It's a tool to be used to do God's work. And God's work is bless people. Whether by the gospel or providing whatever, God's work is bless people. Let's look at someone suffering honest loss. Let's go to Genesis 13. There is a dispute between Abraham and Lot. Both of them have prospered. God blessed both. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together. For the substance was great so that they could not dwell together. Read verse 7 for me of Genesis 3. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. Finish that verse. And the, and the, uh-huh. Yes. The unbelievers were watching. Let's see how these two believing families deal with this thing. <laughs> now, Abraham knew that. Apparently, Lot wasn't too concerned. There are people watching. The Bible, you know, I like the Bible. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. They were observing. Abraham knew this. Abraham's first concern is the honor of God. Read what he says in verse 8. Abraham said, Lord, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between and between and thy herdsmen. Why? Because we be brethren. Does not brothers don't fight? And if to settle this thing, one of us has to suffer loss, let us suffer the loss that God might gain. 
Because if we fight for personal gain, we damage the name of God in the eyes of the Canaanite and the Parasite who are watching. Let there be no strife in Remnant, SDA Church, on the next church board, because we're all brethren. Now, Abraham is trying to solve the problem. Let's read verse 9. What does he say? Is not the whole land before thee? Go on. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt, then I will go to the Or if thou thee, then I will go to the left. Let's separate for the sake of peace. But in that verse, read it again. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt do what? Then I will. In other words, Abraham is saying, Lot, you choose first. Now remember, Abraham was the uncle. God didn't call Lot. God called Abraham. But Lot, knowing a good thing, he traveled with Abraham. Always get close to someone who's close to God. Ah, you didn't hear me. Even if you're a big hypocrite, get close to someone who's close to God. There is protection in that. Mm. So by harassing a Christian, you may be damaging your own protection. So Lot was with Abraham. Abraham had the right to choose first. Abraham suffered an honest loss. Hmm? Read verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that was well watered everywhere. Stop. Why was the Bible saying that? Because they had a lot of herds and cattle. You need grass and water. Lot said, okay, there's all the water. There's all the grass. Abraham, I choose that area. He left Abraham with the hilly areas. Mm -hmm. Abraham suffered an honest loss for the sake of the honor of God. Now, in the eyes of mankind, Lot seemed to have benefited. But go to verse 14 of Genesis 13. Read carefully. Read. Now, let's pause. Let's pray again. Father, as I enter the final phase of my presentation, let the spirit of truth dominate my thinking. Tell me what to say. Possess my mind, dear God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Read from verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, stop. When did God appear in a vision to Abraham in the, ne in the, pre in the next verse? Next chapter. After he gave all the goods to the king of Sodom. You take all. God came to him and said, look, I'm your reward. But God had done that before. Verse 14, read now. Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, what? Lift up thine eyes and look now from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. Stop. God told Abraham, you look. Oh, look. Keep reading. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it. Come on. And stop. Now, Lot chose the plain of Sodom. God gave Abraham everything, including the plain of Sodom. Are you with me? So here's Lot. He's stingy. He chooses this rail. God says, Abraham, you're honest. Take the whole church. You don't lose, really, when you take care of God. And the way to take care of God is to be honest. So God says, look north. You see, a lot of Christians, they're afraid if they see the dollar that's going down. Then I have to be creative in my, econ in my economics and my business. No, 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 no. Because we see money as salvation. You see, money, <laughs> money represents rent, food, tuition, mortgage, car payment, gas. That's what money means to us. And there's nothing wrong with that. So when money starts to dwindle, panic starts to increase. And the flesh decides, what can I do to stop money from dwindling? Which is okay, but not at the expense of integrity. Amen. Because we're not, we were not made, God doesn't desire us to be financial creatures. He wants us to be spiritual beings. So as money declines, 
you hold on to God. Because every believer must be tested. Everyone. And so Abraham saw the best land gone to Lot. And uh, he was left with the, lock, the rocky hills with his flock, and he, fine. For the sake of God, I suffer loss. You can't always win. The Christian who always wants to win and brings the Bible will cause trouble all the time. Because based on the Bible and the customs, he should have chosen first. But listen to me. Ella White writes, I don't recall where, Christ never fought for his rights. You know how many people are dead defending their rights? Christ defended the rights of others, not his. You defend the rights of others, let God defend your rights. I know you're listening to me, you're saying, oh, this fellow needs medication. No, I don't need medication. I really don't. I really don't. I'm just telling what the Bible's teaching, and Ella White backs up. A true Christian is a strange person. I mean strange. So strange that you may need medical intervention in the eyes of the world. You must be mad. I have a friend. He's a professor, so he was paid well, and he'd return a double tithe. And after a few years of that, the IRS, and he would claim it, of course, on his taxes, the IRS sent an agent and said, oh, who is this giving all this money to church? Nobody gives all this money to church. They couldn't believe it. So they sent to have him audited. And the agent had to say, he does give money to the church. Because that's not the way people behave. You may throw a dollar here, a dollar there, but you make 100000 you give God 20000 and then an offering? What's wrong with you? So the IRS had to audit him, and they realized, yes, he gives all that money to the church. Amen. Actually, to God. Amen. When we follow God's principles. You know what? The, was it Felix or Agrippa who told Paul, much learning doth make thee mad. No one who obeys the gospel is mad. He was mad, Paul was saying. What did the, the ruler say? These are the men that turned the world upside down. No, they were turning the world right side up. What's our subject for this afternoon? What is micro-integrity? Applying the principles of God in all the minute areas of our lives. So on Tomorrow, tonight, when you go down to the store because there's a sale to buy a dress, should you practice micro-integrity? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Father, help me to buy a dress that makes me look like a daughter of God. Amen. Let me tell you something, ladies. Don't, don't throw any stones at me. <laughs> Try to develop this habit and see what happens to you. Pray before you dress. Amen. Say to God, Father, what should I wear? As you look at your closet, half a mile long, you look at it. You say, Father, what should I wear? <laughs> huh? If you listen in your heart, the Spirit will tell you, not that, not that, not that, not that. You say, Father, we're running out of dresses. I know, not that, not that, not that, not that, not that. Why, Father, all of this was bought to make you look good? Buy something that makes you look like a child of mine. Amen. This is no joke. Listen to Exodus 20. We're going to Exodus 28 verse 2. Let me show you what I just said is biblical. It's uh, 4, 415. When does question and answer begin? When? Oh, I'll finish. Okay, but you'll get a break, please. And I hope most of you stay for question and answer, but if you have to run, you have to run. But run to the glory of God. Can you say amen? amen. All right. What book did I say? Exodus. What chapter? 28. Now, Aaron and Moses. Who was older? Aaron. By how many years? I think two or three he was older. Now, Aaron was older, but who was the spiritual leader? Moses. Spiritual leadership 
is not necessarily based on age. It's based on God's choice of a person. God could have called Aaron to lead. He called Moses. Now, here's what God tells Moses to do for his older brother. Read verse 2 of Exodus 28. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. Stop. The clothes Aaron must wear as a high priest must reflect two things. Name them. What's glory? The character of God. God's amazing grace. Page 322, paragraph 2. The glory of God is his character. In other words, Aaron must look like a spiritual being. The second thing is beauty. A God who made flowers does not like ugliness. Are you following me? So God believes in beauty, but beauty never supersedes glory. Because the most beautiful thing about God is his character, not the color of his robe. Are you with me? So the prettiest thing about you should be your character, not your shoes that are 10 inches high. Are you following me? All right. <laughs> I don't know how the ladies walk in these things. I really don't know. But there must be some orthopedic damage. There has to be. When you walk like this, there has to be damage to the spine or the ankle or the toenail or something. Anyway, now, so God told Moses, make garments, holy garments. Ah, holy garments. Why should the garments be holy? Because you're serving God. For glory and for beauty. But ladies shop for beauty. And they're so busy shopping for beauty, they forget glory. Look like a child of God. That's boring. I have to look like Beyonce when she's in concert. <laughs> that's how I must look. Are you following me? When she's in concert, that's how I need to look. Like, uh, what's that lady who twerks? I forgot her name. You know, I have to look. Miley Cyrus. I have to look like her while she's twerking. That's how Christian women dress. I need to dress to get a man. No, you dress to glorify God. Then God will choose the right man. Then 50 years later, you're still married. Can you say amen? Micro-integrity. Everything you do. When you're about to paint your toenails, what's the first question you ask? Will this glorify God? Are the ladies angry with me? <laughs> Are there daggers in their eyes? Huh? When you're about to paint your toes, nothing wrong with your toes. Nothing. You have to paint them. Is this for the glory of God? No, I'm not joking. Then you finish with your toes, you get to your fingernails. Is this for the glory of God? And your answer will be, no. I was at a certain church, a certain country on the face of the earth, and there was communion service, and this lady is serving. And I'm participating in the leading out of the service. And I looked, and her toes are red like the blood of Jesus. <laughs> so I said to her, can I talk to you? Sure, Pastor, sure. Why are your toes painted? She said, um, but they don't look nice when they're not painted. I said, but what's your biblical spiritual reason? And she just looked at me. I said, sister, take that thing off. Just take it off. Where if I ask people, why are your toes painted? Uh, I was in another country, and this lady came to the door shaking. Oh, nice sermon. I'm looking at her toes. Nice sermon. Why are your toes painted? <laughs> she said, well, <laughs> I thought they looked nicer. I said, sister, have you never read Leviticus 19.28? Don't print a mark on your body, and your toenail is your body. She said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll clean. I said, sanctify your toes. And the next day, the paint was gone. No, the next day, the paint was gone. She came, Pastor, look at my toes. They're sanctified. Glory, hallelujah. There she did, and they were clean. <laughs> no, I'm serious. She sanctified her toes. What am I saying to you? Think of God first. 
Microintegrity, principle one, God owns everything. Principle two, we're made for service. Principle three, it's better to lose honestly than to gain dishonestly. All right. Do you have any questions on that? Then we'll break and we come to the big question and answer session. Any questions on micro-integrity? By the way, let me say something else. Go to Deuteronomy 7. Now, God is giving the Israelites instructions as to how to interact with the unbelievers. And we need to understand this. Deuteronomy 7. Let's read verse 2 and verse 3 of Deuteronomy 7. Do you have it? Read for me. What does it say? And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them, uh uh-huh, ye shall do what? Say it again clearly. Ye shall smite them, uh uh-huh. Yes, go on. Stop, stop. Thou shall do what? Make, what's a covenant? An agreement. Okay. Go to verse 3. In other words, don't give your children to them in marriage. That's also a covenant. But the covenant in verse 2 is not talking about marriage. Business relationships. Partnerships. The child of God must not enter into business partnership with the unbeliever. Because they have two different standards. Well, I hope they have two different standards. For the child of God, integrity like Abraham. For the unbeliever, get it any way you can. Let me say it again. The child of God must not form alliances with the unbeliever. You have a business with an unbeliever, he wants it open on Sabbath, you don't. What happens? He doesn't want to tithe the prophet, you want to. What happens? Biblical counsel. Let me tell you something. If we would do what God has told us to do, in how many areas of life? Oh, our lives would be so blessed. So free of problems that the world will wonder who are these people. They're not sick. Their children, you know, they go to school in the day. They work in the field in the afternoon. You know, and they are at the top of the, the scores. Their marriages are strong. The children are respectful. The educational system is simple but powerful. Who are these people? Those who obey. We hurt ourselves so much by not obeying God. And I was in a certain country and they said, Pastor, there's a drought, there's been a drought. I said, the drought can stop if the advent is prayed. Are you listening to me? You read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Every miracle in the Bible was either directly for the Israelites or because of them. Mm -hmm. If the believers would come together, confess sins and pray, God would send a rain for them. That the rest of the country may say, wait a minute, who are these people? With that kind of inside track to God. But we just suffer like everybody else. And no one gives God an opportunity to demonstrate his power. When all of Egypt had darkness, the Israelites had light. That was a testimony to the Egyptians. When the the hail fell, some Egyptians, having seen how God spared the Israelites, they brought their cattle inside as they observed the Israelites. And those Egyptians who brought the cattle in, the cattle were spared. If the Israelites had been unfaithful, the Egyptians would never have seen 
that example. My brothers and sisters, do things God's way. Please, in everything you do, do things God's way. And when you fail, say, I'm sorry, try again. The righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up. And so micro-integrity, everything belongs to God. We live to serve. It's better to lose honestly than to gain dishonestly. All right. Any questions? Yes, my dear sister. No, it's not, it's not a question. Okay. All right. So, what are the ramifications when you practice microintegrity in the one of the ramifications when you practice microintegrity in the marketplace mm -hmm. is that after a while there'll be some who appreciate it. Mm -hmm. But because we live in a simple world, there will be others who, can, who will learn to prey upon your good nature. Uh -huh. You become very predictable. Mm -hmm. I worked in finance for 14 years, mm -hmm. and I practiced micro-integrity. Mm -hmm. And to some, I've become very predictable because mm -hmm. they know I'm going to do what's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've had to make a lot of hard decisions to, yes. like you said, cut ties with people mm -hmm. who don't believe as I believe. Mm -hmm. So how, do you, how does one prepare themselves to enter the marketplace mm -hmm. and deal with those individuals who prey upon people uh -huh. who are consistently practicing. All right. First of all, you ask God, should I enter the marketplace? Amen. If you enter where God didn't send you, you're inviting troubles that otherwise would not have come. If it is God's will you enter, you enter with God's honor as your first concern, not whether I'm abused. Jesus was abused. And they took advantage of Jesus. Jesus healed people who then said, crucify him. If the Christian goes through life trying to avoid that's not a Christian life. The Christian life is a life where you open yourself so people can see God in you, but that brings the risk of pain, and you take it. But what must dominate your mind is, did I clear God's name? The answer is yes, and that's all that counts. But in any area of life, remember 1 Timothy 4, verse 8, godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise in this life and in the life that is to come. The honor of God is what, you, yeah, and a, an honest person is predictable. <laughs> He'll always do the right thing. He is predictable. Well, God bless you for being honestly predictable. All right, anybody else? Thank you, my lovely sister. Yes, my good brother. Where's the microphone? Here comes a nice man with a microphone. There you are. Talking about the Sabbath keeping, and uh, just wanted to address something. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a friend of mine, and he was uh, telling me how his, his wife and the family, they had to had work Saturdays, mm -hmm. even though they're there at Venice. Mm -hmm. And says, we, you, know, we, you know, we have to do what is right and help mm -hmm. the poor and all that. But there's an income that is coming on Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, should my wife work Sabbath? Mm -hmm. or, and then another doctor friend of mine said that he takes the money that he receives on Sabbath mm -hmm. and he gives it to the widows and to the orphans. Okay. And so I just wanted to clarify that one point right. because that comes under micro-integrity. Ellen White counsels us. If you're a doctor or nurse, medical professional, you have to go into the hospital, she said, only do what's necessary to ease suffering. Don't just do anything you do on Thursday because you're a Sabbath keeper and the patient must see your Sabbath keeper, but Jesus healed on the Sabbath. So if you go in, you go like a volunteer. You just ease suffering, do the minimum, leave the rest for the rest of the week. And whatever money comes to you, she said, give it away to the church. So you're not paid, you didn't work. If you go to the hospital on Sabbath and sing for the sick and turn them over and change the bed, that's not work. That's doing good. The Bible says it is lawful to do good, not lawful to work. Once you say it's lawful for him to work, then he will say, why isn't it lawful for me to work? You've opened the floodgates. So the fireman wants to work on Sabbath and the electrician wants to work on Sabbath and the guy who sweeps the street wants to work on Sabbath because he's getting rid of germs. Everyone has a reason why to work on Sabbath. Are you with me? All right, somebody else. Ah. You know, the Lord has blessed me with, uh, with a job where I don't have to do it, but I have folks that work for me mm -hmm. that have to work on Sabbath. They're not, they're not Sabbath keepers, but mm -hmm. I feel guilty about mm -hmm. even having them work on mm -hmm. Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Can you help me here, my brother? You go to God. You say, Father, here's the situation I'm in. God is our Father. 
God, I, I, there's a young lady I speak to. She lives in a, well, I won't say what country. She's about 17. I, I encourage, she, she loves God, and I encourage her all the time. Study, study, study. She wrote, I said, she wrote, and she told me something. I said, well, ask God. Ask God. Why are you asking me? So she went to God and prayed. She, she said, listen, God answered me. Amen. That's what she said. Here's what I'm saying to you. Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. In any area of life. Psalm 25, verse 4. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy truth, thy path. Lead me in thy truth. What should I do? And when God sees your heart is to do what's right, he will direct you and convict you. Be prepared to do what conviction he places on your heart. Mm -hmm. Thanks, my good brother. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. Uh-huh. Okay, the microphone is coming. It's not too far away. We're about to hear a testimony. All right, my brother, testimony up. Yeah, I wanted to share this testimony about micro-integrity. When mm -hmm. I was in school, I mm -hmm. finished my courses for physical therapy, and a lot mm -hmm. of my classmates gathered together to study for the board exam, mm -hmm. but they had answers to the test. They were cheating. Oh. And I refused to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it took me seven years mm -hmm. But I passed my exam, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I had a clear conscience yes, with God. Yes, So I yes. praise him for well, that. Well, God and bless you and make you a blessing. Mungu wa kubariki sana. You speak Swahili? Oh, I thought you were from Kenya. Me? Yeah. Oh, no, okay, sorry, sorry. I thought you were from Kenya. Okay. I just said God bless you a lot. Okay. All right. <laughs> I don't know why I thought you were from Kenya. Yes, my good brother. Yes, uh, I have a question. I wanna uh, yes, go ahead. Text. Uh, Deuteronomy 7. Mm -hmm. It says, uh, in the Lord... That God um, shall deliver them before thee, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and they shall smite them. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. those those people uh, mm -hmm. um, before, I feel like sometimes I'm presented with people in my life that is like that, mm -hmm. or necessarily um, God brings me to uh, some people that's not actually in the same belief or mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. am in, mm -hmm. and uh, it says not to mingle with them as mm -hmm. well, but. You know, before you're talking about serving, serving God, serving mm -hmm. man and mm -hmm. people. So it's like mingling. I have a trouble how to set that boundary. Right. Okay. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, it does. It yeah. makes a lot of sense. Now, yeah. we are to be in the world, but not of the world. You can't save people if you don't mingle with them. But the mingling has to have a specific purpose. L.Y. says, the society of unbelievers will do us no harm if we mingle with them for the purpose of connecting them to God and are strong enough spiritually to withstand the influence. That's counsel for the church, page 312, paragraph 3, I think, I'm guessing now. She, let me give it again. The society of unbelievers will do us no harm if we mingle with them for the purpose of connecting them with God and are strong enough spiritually to withstand the influence. So you have, to be, you have to know yourself, am I strong enough for this? You know, some young people say, well, my friend invited me to the Should I go? No. I don't want you to come back, you know, crazy. No. Don't go. Stay where you are. Can you defend the truth? Can you defend the sanctuary? Can you defend the Sabbath? Can you defend? No. Well, don't go. Are you following me? By the way, Elohim said only select Adventist youth should go to non-Adventist schools. Only select those who are strong. Only those should go. But unfortunately, more than 70% of our youth go to these schools. Anyway, all right, anything else? Yes, my dear brother. This question is coming from Texas. Oh, okay. person by the name of Anna Rajana. The name They're is what? asking Anna Rajana. Anna Rajana, okay. Okay. God bless They're you wherever you are. Actually, his name is Ruben. Reuben is the name. God bless Reuben in Texas. All right, Brother Reuben. You're asking about in terms of employing unbelievers. Employing unbelievers. Since employment is a contract. Okay, employing unbelievers. Now, let's go to the Bible. Go to Galatians 6. Am I over time, Mother Pastor? Well, not, not long. <laughs> not so long. <laughs> Good question. Not long. Go to Galatians 6. Now. Should we employ unbelievers? Okay. 
The Bible preaches favoritism. Did you know that? <laughs> okay, it does. Read verse 10 nice and loud. Before we read, let's pray again. Father, we can't talk too long without seeking your help and leaning on your fresh. Give us more wisdom, dear God, so those who listen may be blessed and enlightened. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Read verse 10, Galatians 6, nice and loud. As we have, therefore, opportunity, let us do good unto who? All men, but keep reading, especially, uh-huh, who are of the household of faith. Now, you are an employer. You have a vacancy. Search for one of your people first. God will back you up. The Bible says, let us do good unto all men, especially to those who... <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, some people in the household of faith are just lazy. Are you following me? And that's not a spiritual gift. They're just lazy. That's not who we're talking about. Someone who is qualified, who can do the work. You've got a qualified member, a qualified non-member. You pick the qualified member. That's no sin. Especially to those who have the household of faith. Now, Surely, from an evangelistic standpoint, you can have one or two un uh, unbelievers. Why? To put them in an environment of righteous behavior so they can see honesty, they can see integrity, they can see micro-integrity. Ah. A few months later, we have a baptism. Are you following me? But the believer first. God bless Reuben in Texas. We have a question from online. This is from Alexis. From where, where is that from? Alexis from New Mexico. Alexis from New Mexico, how are you? That's a nice name, Alexis. God bless you. And she, her question is regarding 1 Corinthians 7, 15. And she says she's praying about this. She's praying about what? 1 Corinthians 7, 15. Okay, uh-huh. And her question is, mm -hmm. for a marriage where both are unconverted, mm -hmm. and after one is converted, what can, what can you do? Uh -huh. What if the unbelieving wants to depart from the believing? Well, the Bible said if unbelieving wants to depart, let the unbelieving depart. But God prefers staying together. That's what Calvary preaches. Galatians, uh, Malachi 2 verse 16, the Lord, the God of Israel saith, he hateth putting away. So do everything in your power to preserve it. That's always the first choice. Reconcile, preserve, save. But if the unbeliever wants to leave, the unbeliever leaves. But God prefers to stay together. And 1 Peter chapter 3, the first three verses, tells us how to keep the unbeliever and get that person converted. Demonstrate in your life an honest, upright life. Let the unbeliever see it, and that will bring that person to Christ. Mm -hmm. God bless Alexis. Good question. Alexis, keep studying and praying for wisdom. Somebody else. All right. It's 20 minutes to 5. I know you. Or just one more? Okay. Oh, yes. There are, there are a lot of things that are happening in, in, in these last days, especially mm -hmm. a lot of practices mm -hmm. from the Catholic Church as mm -hmm. it were coming into Adventist Church, mm -hmm. like doing 48 days of Lent and okay. prayer okay. and all of that okay. type, kinds okay. of things. Uh -huh. And we are seeing that creeping into the Adventist Church. Mm -hmm. What advice can you give on these things? Well, we have to be vigilant. One of the gifts of the Spirit is discerning of spirits. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10. And it is lacking in the church, or, it, or its expression is lacking. The church seems unable to discern. What's going on? You see? So a lot of things will creep into the church. The church needs leadership with the power of discernment to see what is happening and to take biblical and spiritual prophecy steps to check it and to stop it. Are you following me? But the Israelites always wanted to be like the rest of the world. Not just in the days of Saul. They wanted to be like the rest of the world all the time. It's a tremendous temptation to God's people to be like everybody else. Because peculiarity can become a burden if you're not constantly connected to God. And so the church needs to observe these things and protect the church against them. Amen. And that protection must be done by the leaders. So Paul, in Acts 20, he tells the elders of Ephesus, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. You must protect the flock. Amen. A leader who sees no further than those whom he leads shouldn't be a leader. 
The leader must see further and protect the church. And more will come in. Some will come in from us. It's already in. It will be expressed. And Paul says that. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples unto them. You have to study this. You know how the papacy arose? People stopped studying the Bible. You study it for me. Oh, okay. Up came the papacy. Mm -hmm. I was in a certain country. I was in a hotel. I spoke to one of the workers. I said, uh, you go to church? He said, yes. When? Every Sunday. Okay. Do you read the Bible? No. Why not? My pastor reads it for me. That's what she said. I said, sister, are you well? Your pastor reads it for you. You must read the Bible for yourself. She said, no, he reads it for us. I said, okay, sister, excuse me. Let no one study the Bible for you. Now, let me admit, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. God has given some people tremendous gifts for studying and for getting knowledge quickly. Yes, we have, and so they help us. But the fundamental responsibility is you study for yourself. Amen. If you just take it from me, you're just swallowing what I chewed. Are you following me? Study the Bible. Because in the act of studying, your mind grows. And God has promised the spirit of truth will guide you. Someone sent me a text last night. A pastor, help me explain Haggai chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. I said, no, 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 no. Go read the reason why the book was written. Go find out the historical context. Find out if there's any other prophet that served at the time of Haggai. Find out the literary structure. Do that and see what you learn. Then come back to me. My spiritual gift is not spoon feeding. Are you following me? It's not. Go do some work. And when you discover, you will be excited. God has spoken to you. Too many people say, what does this mean? Because Bible study takes time. And it takes effort. And no one wants to put in the time or the effort. So what does this mean? What does this mean? And nobody grows. Yes, my handsome brother in the back. Someone get a mic to him. Oh, you've got it. You're prepared. You're a boy scout. Be prepared. All right. Uh, Yes. Uh, Pastor, uh, I want to follow up with what Brother Siraj has stated. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is not only go, uh, coming into the church, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to mention any names. Good, good, good. However, though, there is a Seventh day Adventist chaplain who did perform Ash Wednesday. Okay. That's a fact. Okay. Okay. All right. I didn't believe it myself okay. until I went <laughs> okay. and I seen uh -huh. and I took a picture, but I'm not going to say mm -hmm. who it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to the, this chaplain mm -hmm. and tell him mm -hmm. what he's doing is wrong mm -hmm. and what have you. But mm -hmm. I, he's so busy that okay. I didn't have the chance. Okay. So I'm asking that you pray for me because right. I believe that the Lord has commissioned me mm -hmm. to go talk to him because mm -hmm. I was amazed to find out mm -hmm. that the people who I was directing them to go see, I didn't know it was Ash, you know, Ash Wednesday at the time. Mm -hmm. But when they came back, they had the ash on their forehead. Oh. And I said, who? I said, where's this coming from? Mm -hmm. So another Seventh day Adventist came to me and said, Everett, you don't know, you won't believe who's doing this. Mm -hmm. I said, who? Mm -hmm. So he told me. Mm -hmm. I said, you're lying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, go, go, go see for yourself. Mm -hmm. So I had somebody cover me. And I went upstairs, mm -hmm. chaplain came mm -hmm. out with the ash on his forehead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it amazed me. I yes. mean, I, and I looked, and I said, you know, Elder, I said, can I take a picture with you? Mm -hmm. He said, well, I have this thing on my face. I said, okay, just come on. Let's take mm -hmm. the picture. Mm -hmm. And I, because nobody would ever believe me. Yes, 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 yes. So I showed, I text messaged Adrian, and I said, you wouldn't believe me if I showed you. I had to show you this. Mm -hmm. she, she text messaged back. She said, Lord have mercy. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, I want you to pray for me because I, I'm really bothered by this. Uh -huh. But it needs to be said to All me. All right. Okay. Now, ask God to give you the words. Tell God, tell me what to say at the right time and in the right spirit so that your efforts produce fruit. Yes, yes, yes. God bless you. Okay, yes, sister. Which quote? I have to double check that for you. I think it's Councils for the Church, page 312, paragraph 3. Does anyone have Ellen White? You can check it and see if I'm right. Councils for the Church, page 312, paragraph 3. I think that's the one for uh, mingling with the unbeliever, does us no, does us no damage. Check and see. 
Uh, Council of Jurors 312, paragraph 3, I think it is. Okay, anything else? Yes, my dear brother. Another question from online? Yes, Who is this person? All right, the microphone is coming. Uh, this question is from Richard from New York City. Richard. Richard from where? New York City. New York City, the Big Apple. Hello, Richard. His question is, can I donate my tithe to someone doing God's missionary work abroad? Okay. That is a good question. It's an honest question. Thank you, Brother Richard. In the book of Judges, several times it's mentioned, Every man did that which was right in his own sight. That's when there was no king, you see. It was a wild time, in the wild time. About 300 years before Saul became the first king. Every man did that which was right. Now, you can't have that going on in the church. It's every member decides, oh, I know someone serving in Alaska. Let me send my tithe. And I know someone serving in Papua New Guinea. Let me send my tithe. Then the church collapses. Now, I do not deny there may be isolated occasions with the Spirit of God convicts you to do that. But the place for the tithe is the local church to the local conference. Are you following me? Do things. Now, Brother Richard, I hope you're listening. Notice I said there may be isolated occasions when you can do that. But if you make it a practice and somebody finds out, you may influence someone to do the same thing. It may have a ripple effect and the local church will suffer. And so let's do things the proper way. Trusting that God knows how to take care of his people wherever they are. So I'm granting some leeway that from time to time, that may be okay. But the normal procedure should be followed. Bring the tithe to your local storehouse. Go to the conference. They handle it. All right. God bless you, Richard, for having a heart for God's servants. Yes, my dear brother. No, I'm just confirming. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, Council for the Church, page 312, paragraph 3. All right, that's it, my sister. I had a wild guess. I was correct. Okay. Any question? Any other question? You're welcome, sister. You're welcome. God bless you. Any other question? Any other question from online? Okay. <laughs> okay. For those of you online sending questions, please send an offering. Okay. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> that's just a, a big one. All right. <laughs> but Remnant SDA Church. Okay. Yes. This What's the one? person's name? is Trace. Trace. Hello, Trace. And she's from Jamaica. Jamaica's a good place. I spent a year in Jamaica. Back then, you can buy 12 oranges for 50 cents. <laughs> now I think it's $50,000. Okay. Yes, Sister Trace, what's your question? Or he, is it a man or a woman? A she. she Sister yes. Trace. All right. I hope I'm right. Yes. The question is, the Bible says, whatever you desire, you should pray. Uh-huh but toward God's will. Uh -huh. Should I discontinue because God knows what I already want? Nope, 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 nope. I've heard that before where God knows what I want. Why am I praying? Jesus prayed. Are you with me? Jesus prayed. Who is the... Go to Genesis 12, quickly. Let me show you about praying. A lot of Christians don't want to pray. But God knows what I want. Why am I praying? Because praying is spiritual exercise. Go to Genesis 12 quickly. Someone read verse 4. This God calling Abraham, Abraham has answered a call. Genesis 12, verse 4. Who has that? First person to have it, read it. So Abraham departed, and Lot went with him. Seventy-five years old when he departed out of? Haran, yes, he was 75. Now, let's go to uh, Genesis 17. Not Genesis 17. Uh, Genesis 21, let's read verse 5, I think it is. I think it's 5 or 4 of Genesis 21. He was 75 when he left, came into Canaan. Read Genesis 21, verse 4. No, verse 5. He was 100 years old, come on. When the sun, uh -huh. Now, how long did he pray? 25 years? Not, where well, he knows I want a son, let me go sunbathe. No, he prayed 25 years. Are you with me? Go to Genesis 24. No, not 24, uh, 25. Genesis 25. Let's read verse 40 and 41. Well, let's read 41 to save time. Genesis 25, verse 41. You don't have Genesis 25, verse 40? Not 41, 21, sorry. It ends at verse 34, I think. Okay, sorry. Verse 21. 
So let's read. What does it say? And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. What do you understand by entreated the Lord? He prayed. Why? She was barren. Finish the verse. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived all in one verse. You get the impression he prayed on Tuesday, and she had a child on Wednesday. That's the impression you get. Read verse 26. Uh-huh. 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 Isaac was three score years when? Now he was 60. Read verse 20. He was 40 years old when he married her. How long did he pray? 20 years. Sister Trace, keep praying. All right. God bless Sister Praise. God bless Jamaica. Okay. You know, I think the Governor General of Jamaica is an Adventist. Am I right? Or some high official or somebody in Jamaica is. The President? Prime Minister of the Governor? No? Well, some big shot. Is an Adventist in Jamaica. All right. Anybody else? We have another one online? Yes. <laughs> okay. These onlineers must send an offering. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. This is Danielle. Danielle. That's a lady. From New York City. Ah, Danielle, how are you doing? Nice to see you. Thanks for the question. Her question is, when will we know to leave the city? Oh, good question. We have to continue to work to live and to share Christ to those who do not know him. Uh -huh. When would we leave? Ellen White counsels us, live in the country, work in the city. Are you with me? So you've already left. Now, you have to know how to live in the country. Are you following me? You just can't pop up from, you know, the Bronx and go live somewhere behind. A, you, know, you can't do that. You have, how will I provide fuel? How will I provide electricity? You have to know. And you have to be praying, Father, is it right for me? Not just a mass movement of the church. Is it time for this family to move into the country? Now, we know we've been counseled for decades. Get out of the cities. When the bombing took place in Boston, you remember the marathon a few years ago? They shut down the whole city. No one could get in or out. They shut the whole city down. They just shut down. What's a city in Texas? They shut it down for... Ah, because of these bombings. Cities can be shut down like that. You can't shut down the country. And so LOI counselors get out. But you must ask God, is it the right time for me to get out? God is the God of time. The right thing at the right time. And so my dear sister Danielle, you ask God, Father, I have a desire to leave the city. Because everything in the city is unfavorable spiritually. Everything. When is the right time? Show me because you see my heart is to leave. And God will impress you. In the meantime, learn about country living. You understand? So God sees you. Learn about what it means to live in the country. Learn it. There's some, you know, right, uh, amazing discoveries. There's always some man talking about country living. Get some information. Find out how do I establish myself in the country. Let God see you serious. And he'll guide your steps. But thank you very much for considering such an important step. Going into the country. L.Y. says, fathers and mothers with a piece of land and a comfortable home are kings and queens. God bless Danielle in New York. Anybody else? Yes, my good brother. Where's the microphone for this nice man? It's a five to five. Yes. An important question. Which great controversy do you read? Which one? Which one? I, here's a good question. Usually the 1911. 1911. Yeah, usually, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I know there's a lot of controversy about the 1898, the 1911, all, but I usually use 1911. Yes. Um, between 911 and the other one, the uh, 1898 one, I think, or 898. Flat between the two. Yes. And finishing, read the 1884. Mm -hmm. It was the first one that was published. Okay, all right. All right, my good brother. Okay, I'll give it a once over, as they say. All right, anybody else? Online. Okay. <laughs> Who is this now online? This is uh, Desiree from Desiree, Maryland. Desiree, what a lovely name. Sister Desiree, Danielle, Desiree, Trace. Okay, where's Desiree from? Maryland. Maryland, oh, she's right here. Yes. She may be in the parking lot. Okay, <laughs> let's, uh, let's listen to Desiree. What does she have to say? Her question is, if I have an online store, do uh -huh. I give the sales or profit during Sabbath hours to God, or are the tithes from week total weekly income 
appropriate? What an excellent question. If I have, you see, as, as technology progresses, we have different challenges. But God is the same, and the integrity never changes. Read the question again, my good brother, from Desiree. Read it again so we can all hear it clearly. If I have an online store, mm -hmm. do I give the profit earned during Sabbath hours to God? Mm -hmm. Or are the tithes from weekly income appropriate? That's where you have to ask God, what should your individual action be? Ask God. Now, I would consider me giving the Sabbath earnings to God. Are you following me? You don't lose by giving God too much. There's no such thing, actually, as giving God too much. Are you following me? We think there is, but there's no such thing. All right. I would give the Sabbath earnings to God and say, Father, you take care of me. That's it. Because there's nothing God loves more than those who try to honor him. But as an individual, because religion is first individual, we are saved individually. Salvation is an individual matter. You ask God, Father, what should I, Desiree, do with my online business? Should I just give the Sabbath earnings to you or should I do something else? As long as God sees your heart is to honor him, he will direct you. Believe that. Remember Psalm 32, verse 8, I will instruct thee, but he instructs you through his word. Psalm 119, verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. In which direction should I go? Sister Dan, uh, Desiree. So ask God and ask him sincerely. Take a day and fast. Let God see you serious. When God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, the Bible says Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him, claved the wood for the burnt offering, took Isaac to his son, walked three days, he saw the place, he built an altar, he tied up Isaac, he took the knife. God says, now I know. Now I know. So Desiree, show God you're serious. Do some investigation. Pray to him. Take a day to fast. And God will convict you on the right behavior. I'm glad you're thinking in the direction of honesty. God bless you, my sister Desiree. Yes, my good brother. And uh, she also have a, another option. She can shut the website down on that day. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. You know. Um, Here's a nice right man Sabbath. who says, yeah. Desiree, you can close down the website on Sabbath and perhaps leave some information on your website that the website will not be functional between one hour before sunset on Friday, one after. Yes. Yeah. Oh, God bless you. You see, God answered you immediately. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we must help each other. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, sister. Who is that? Yeah. Oh, um, yes, my brother Sanjay. Question uh, about friendship. Yes. Um, as to how you choose your friends. Uh-huh. If uh, the parents are advising uh, their children mm -hmm. about choosing friends, uh -huh. uh, what should be the uh, advice in such if your Christian parents advise you against it, don't do it. Amen. You have not lived as long as your parents. I don't care if you're going to Harvard, you did not live as long as your parents. They have the edge. They have seen human behavior. They have seen tragedies. They have seen examples of where you're headed. If your Christian parents tell you don't do it, don't do it. Especially if you're under 18, don't do it. You know what's mesmerizing about young people? I used to be one a long time ago. I forgot how long ago it was. Here's a 12-year-old boy, <laughs> 13. He will listen to another 13-year-old friend and not his parents. We've all gone through that. It's just the most amazing thing to me. Because teenagers come home, they say, my friends do this, why can't I do it? My friends have that, how come I don't have a clock? My friends have a car, how come I don't have a car even though I'm six years old? My friend do this and my friends do that. Are you with me? That's how they function. If your God-fearing parents say we're against it, respect your parents, leave it alone. Because if you pursue it and get into trouble, you bring the trouble straight to your parents. The same people you didn't listen to. You know, young people have this saying, this is my life. No, it's not your life. It's mine, it's the pastor, it's the church, it's your parents. Because if you get into trouble, you embarrass the church, you embarrass your family. You ought to be sent to an island in the Pacific. Okay, so it is not your life. <laughs> if your parents are against it, respect them. When you become your own man, do whatever you like, if you're still determined. All right. Yes, my dear sister. So God is a God of mercy. Yes, he, he is. He is loving and he is kind. Mm -hmm. So the text for this text from Numbers 31, 17 says, Now therefore, kill every male among the little ones and mm -hmm. kill every woman that mm -hmm. hath known man by lying with him. Mm -hmm. 
Why did God allow this or rather command to do so? Please can you explain why the innocent little ones were killed? Okay, all right. Let us go to Genesis 19. And thank God for bringing these things to my head. Genesis 19. This is the two angels going to Sodom where Lot lived. Are you with me? All right. Let's read verse 4 of Genesis 19. When you found it, let me know. It's 5 o'clock. Now we have to pick up an offering, so don't run. Are you with me? If you run, leave it in the pew. Next to someone who's converted, leave your offering right in the pew. All right. Genesis 19. <laughs> Genesis 19. Okay. Do you have Genesis 19? Let's pray again. Father in heaven, we're having a good time, but we must do it in a way you approve of. Please, God, give me the words, Father, please. For your glory and for the blessing of those who are listening, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Read verse 4 of Genesis 19. Before they lay down, those are the angels, come on, the men of the city, uh-huh, even the men of Sodom, mm -hmm, compass the house round. Keep reading. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Both who? Mm-hmm. What did they come to do? What did they come to do? To sodomize two angels. Both old. The young probably came to learn. Are you with me? To observe. Listen to me. Young people can be dangerous. I mean really young. God also knows the way a life will turn out. Are you listening to me? God can see if I let him live. Here's how we'll end up. And the longer you live in sin, the more you pay in the judgment. Ah, you didn't hear me. God punishes us proportionately. Every man according as his work shall be. Some are beaten with many stripes, others with few stripes. If I live a life of sin for 70 years, I am punished more severely than someone who lives a life of sin for 20 Mm -hmm. Now, let's look at an example of God saying, kill everybody, the Amalekites, hmm? or the Amorites. Let's go to Genesis 15 quickly. The sun hasn't set yet, don't panic. Genesis 15, Abraham is in a dream or a vision, God is speaking to him. Here's what God tells Abraham. Genesis 15, let's read from verse 13. Read for me, what does it say? Said unto him, know for a surety that thy seed shall be strangers in a land that is not their stock. God is telling Abraham, sometime down the road, the Israelites will be in Egypt as slaves. Keep reading. And shall serve, and shall serve them, and shall afflict them 400 years. Keep reading. And also that nation, come on, whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. Now listen to verse, the next verse. Come on, or the next two. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither. In other words, after 400 years, they shall come hither again. Keep reading. Why will it take 400 years? Here's the reason. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God is saying, all these Amorites, they still have an opportunity to repent. So you can't just come on in. God gave the Amorites... 400 years. Now, when the Israelites were coming in, now God said, okay. You see, keep in mind, the Israelites were God's weapon in his hand. This is God destroying the, the, the not the Israelites, God. He doesn't function that way anymore. He no longer has a people that way. That's why he said, my kingdom is not of this world. He will have it again when Christ comes back. So the Israelites were God's instrument to do his will. He said, kill all of them. Because the sooner, the best thing God can do for a sinner is kill him. I mean a determined sinner. That's what I should have said. Because the quicker he, the quicker he dies, the less he suffers in the flames of hell. This is mercy. But what do people see? A bloodthirsty God. It is mercy. God destroys no one unless that person has had ample opportunity. So no one can say, you could have done something else. You can't say that to God. All the destruction of tribes, God directed using the Israelites as his instrument. God is not bloodthirsty. God is merciful. That's why when people are 
at a stage where nothing can happen, you pull the plug. It's mercy. You're not a murderer. You pull the plug. Mercy. All right, somebody else. Yes, my dear brother. Yeah, this was a, <clears throat> a question submitted earlier on. All right. I don't know who submitted it's okay. it, but it was okay. someone here at the church. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what are the two immutable things mentioned in Hebrews 6, 18? Oh, okay, let's go to Hebrews 6, 18. Hebrews 6, 18. Let's take a look at what the Bible has to say. Let's read 17, then we'll read 18. Of Hebrews 6, one of the most important books in the Bible is Hebrews. Especially for Adventists. Do you have Hebrews 6, verse 18? No, verse, let's read from 17. What does it say? Wherein, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it now. In other words, God had, there's something God is confirming. Are you following me? You can only confirm what has already been done. Are you following me? I know you're not. You can't confirm something that doesn't exist. So if I promise to come to speak to you next week, then I send a text to the pastor to confirm that. God had done something. And in order to convince his people, I will do what I said. He did something else. Now let's go to verse 18. Read for me. That by, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Stop. Now the question is, what are those two things? Let's go find out what they are. Go to Genesis 12. Let's find out what those two things are. Genesis 12, 10 after 5. Deacon, stay at the door with your things. If someone slips out, make sure you stretch that thing out. <laughs> your Lord will bless you, don't worry. Okay, where are we? Genesis 12. Let's read from verse 1. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing now. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now that's a promise. That's one thing in which God can't lie. He made a promise. And we find it repeated in... Uh, Reading up to this chapter 22, let's go to 22 now, where God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Let's read from verse 15 of Genesis 22. We identified one thing. God promised, I'll make a great nation. Through you, all kindreds of the earth shall be blessed. That's one thing. Now, God wants to confirm that. Are you with me? Genesis 22, reading from verse 15. What does it say? And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, come on. By myself have I, ah, stop. Have I what? Sworn. In chapter 12, what did he do? He promised. In chapter 22, he swears. What are the two things? A promise and an oath. An oath. Now, God did not need the oath because he can't lie. But God is so eager to give us assurance Amen. that what I say I'll do, Amen. you're forcing me to act in a way I don't need to act. Okay, here's an oath. And then we still doubt him. And so Paul writing in Hebrews, where God, in two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. He made a promise, that should have been enough. Then he backed it up with an oath. Those are the two things. Listen to me, God wants to save us. He promised it and he swore by himself. Let's keep reading. Read verse 16. By myself, have I sworn, saith the Lord, that in, ah, and hath not, thy son, only son Isaac, mm -hmm. go on, I will bless thee and in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand. Keep reading, and the gates of his enemy. Keep reading, and in thy seed, all, that's what we read in chapter 12, verse 3. But this time, it's repeated as an oath. Mm -hmm. 
Ah, God wants to be believed. I promise I can't lie. I need to do nothing else. But since human beings don't believe me, let me back it up with an oath. God goes the extra mile. Then he calls us to go the extra mile. All right, anything else? Yes, my dear brother. I have. Yeah, I think all of us uh, really admire the way you learn the scriptures. How do you do that? How, how is it that you know the scriptures so okay. well? Okay, it's, it's an uncomfortable topic of discussion for me. <laughs> no, no, it really is because, uh, you know, in a, <laughs> a quarter passage of scripture, then I'll give it to you later. And on a certain day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God, not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, for he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. This man gave a speech and did not credit God. God killed him immediately. Now that's in the Bible for me. Are you following me? It's for me. I don't want to die today. Are you with me? <laughs> so I, uh, I tell God, look, <laughs> yeah. take all the glory. And let me look around to see if you left a drop. Here it is. Don't kill me, please. So I am very unwilling, but I'll say briefly, Bible, not Bible commentary, Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 601, paragraph 4. Here's what Ella White writes. That which at first seems difficult, by constant repetition grows easy. It is true. You do something over and over and over, you get it. But do we have the discipline to do it over and over? And the, the answer is no. So my brother, there's no magic. It is over. If I get up at 3 o'clock to go to the bathroom, while I'm in the bathroom, I recite. If I'm going downstairs from the basement to the top floor, I recite something. If I turn on my iPad, it takes 30 seconds to come alive. I recite something as I wait. There is always time to recite or to learn. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Finish it. And that's found where? Psalm 119 what? Verse 11. Okay. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed there. So I urge you, we're Seventh-day Adventists. What commandment are we known for? What is, how, what is the first word in the, first, in the fourth commandment? Remember. That's a command to use your memory. You're commanded to remember. All right, let's drop that. Okay, God bless you. God bless you. And I use the King James Version. Yes, my lovely sister. Um, I have a burden in my heart. Say it again. I have a burden in my heart. You have a what? A burden. Oh, a burden, a burden, yes, yes. Our young adults are leaving the church. Uh huh. Uh, when I was trying to find out, some people are re really looking for friends. And our male and female friends are not being together. Is I there any way the church is providing some kind of program? especially after they leave home, like after graduating high school. Uh -huh. So is there any way you, if you can make a plan for, me? specifically for the young Oh, me, well, not me, but uh, that's, listen, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he leaves college, he'll not depart. That's what the Bible says. We don't have a plan after they leave college, my lovely sister. You raise that child to be faithful to God. That's how Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah remained faithful in corrupt Babylon. There was vice all over. It's like standing in the middle of Lake Superior. But they were because they had been raised that way. Ellen White said 50% of a child's personality is formed by the age of three. Now, if you wait until after college, you're in a lot of trouble. So, you know, sister, I look at the New Testament. I don't see a model of a church where there's women's ministries, men ministries, singles, divorce, short, professional, rich, poor, non-Americans. I don't see that. I just see one church family blessed by the gospel. Are you following me? You don't need a program for when they leave college. You raise them to honor God. 
and you let them see examples in the home. Because children learn by what they see, not by what you tell them. So we have to, st yes, we start in the womb. Listen to Luke 1 15. And he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, John the Baptist, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. L.Y. says training of a child begins in the womb. Of course, if that never happened, you may try to have a program, fine. But you, the odds are against you. Because if you haven't got, you know, the Catholics say, when I was a Catholic, they had a saying, give me a child for the first seven years, I'll give you a Catholic for life. And they weren't joking. We must raise them a certain way. So when they hit college, they hit college as prophets and prophetesses. But if they haven't been raised and they're in college, they're just going here and there, then we have to figure out something to do. But I'll tell you something. You know what keeps people in church? This. Not rock music. Rock music keeps people in the church building. This keeps people in Christ. Are you following me? <laughs> I've gone places to preach. And uh, they've said to me, you know, our usual attendance is 25 a night. I say, okay. Do you have any slides? No. Any, uh, what's that thing, PowerPoint? No. What do you have? I have this. <laughs> what, yeah. I, was, I won't say what church. They said, you know, before you came, our average attendance at Cruises was 25, 30. With just this, we average 160. Just, wherever I go, I find people attracted to a plane, thus saith the Lord. I was in a certain city in the United States about four years ago, and the conference ex ministerial secretary came one night at the crusade, and he looked around, and he called the pastor. He said, how do you get 200 people in this church on a Tuesday night? So the pastor told me, let's go to the conference. So when I got to the conference, the quest he asked me the same question, and I just showed him a Bible. What else am I going to show him? Sports Illustrated? I showed him a Bible. And he said, okay. <laughs> Listen, this is what holds people. Without man's opinion. This. You'll be amazed. It'll hold your children. Mm -hmm. It'll hold your children. I've had children come to me. Pastor, thanks for that message. And I was shocked. I didn't realize they were listening. Children, if it's, it's, the message is simple, will understand this. This is what holds people. Not all the game. There's a church. What's it called? This fellow, was it? This guy had a church in Midwest somewhere. He had uh, comedians and all sorts of things for the members. And several years later, he confessed he was wrong. That's not the way to hold people. He was just wrong. And, oh, thousands came. Because all people love an environment where they're not rebuked. So thousands came. But he said he was wrong. Attendance was large, spirituality was small. 